Good morning, and welcome to the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs webinar on Teen Survivor Support Groups. Uh, trainings on pertinent topics such as this are one of the ways in which WICSAP strives to support your work as advocates for sexual assault survivors. For those of you who may be less familiar with our coalition, we are also available to you for any questions or resource needs that you may have in your daily work. Before we begin, I want to cover a few logistics. Hopefully you're hearing the audio okay through your phone line. Um, as I said before, you can let us know in the chat feature if you're having any problems with the volume or the clarity. We'll also be using that chat feature to take all questions today. You'll find that on the bottom left-hand part of your screen, and we'll answer some as we go along as they are related to our content, and the others will be reserved for the end of the webinar. At the end of today's webinar, you'll receive a copy of the slides in a follow-up email, and this will also be your opportunity to print a confirmation of your training attendance. The webinar recording and materials will also be posted on our website under trainings and events, so please check back in a week or two to access this. If you're sharing a computer with a colleague and you didn't register or you didn't log into the webinar using your personal link, you can send us an email and we'll add you to our list of attendees and make sure that you also have a copy of the proof of training hours. You can email that to erin at wixap.org, that's E-R-I-N at W-C-S-A-P dot org. And finally, we would really appreciate if at the end of our webinar you would take a few minutes to fill out the very quick SurveyMonkey evaluation to give us some feedback and help us continue to improve our webinar offerings throughout the year. I'll now turn the phone lines over to our presenters today. Good morning, thanks for being with us. Uh, my name is Logan Michael and I'm the Child Advocacy Specialist here at the Washington Coalition. Um, I've been here for about three and a half years now and have really had the privilege of um, co-writing this support group guide with my colleague, Jennifer. Good morning. This is Jennifer Levy-Peck. I'm the Program Management Specialist here at the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs, and I've been with WICSAP for the last five years, and Logan and I have collaborated on previous support group guides, and we've really enjoyed putting together the Teen Survivor Support Group Guide for uh, for the field, for advocates in the field. So, um, we'd like to get started, and we're really glad to have such a nice group of folks joining us today. We've got a good turnout. The way that we would like to approach the Teen Support Group Guide is to talk about how we are going to integrate empowerment-based advocacy principles into these support groups, because we think that that's an, a very critical part of what we do. Um, we'd like to also, in this webinar, share how we've really focused on using the principles of trauma-informed services to shape support group practice. In addition, one of our core values is uh, an anti-oppression approach, and so making sure that we use those principles to ensure that our groups are, are inclusive, that they're available to a wide variety of teens. And then lastly, to really talk about, in practical terms, how do we make these groups uh, a place where survivors' voices are heard, where teens feel empowered, and where they're able to grow through that process. <coughs> Excuse me. So Logan and I co-wrote this guide over the course of a year, but we had a lot of help. Uh, we had a great deal of input from support group facilitators across the state. We really tried to harvest their wisdom and their experience in the writing of this book. Uh, the previous year, we had collaborated on a non-offending parent and caregivers group guide, and we started to really shape a clear view of the issues that we wanted to highlight. Uh, we wanted to tell you that this support group guide is part of a family of support group guides that, that WICSAP has now developed. The basic one is our general support group facilitators guide, which is called Circle of Hope. And that particular publication is undergoing revision right now. However, uh, we don't intend for this webinar or for the support group guide itself to be a standalone resource for running a teen group. Facilitators need to have a basic background and training in group dynamics 
they need to understand about the nature of psychoeducational support groups and also about the issues that teen survivors of sexual abuse and assault may face. So the support group guide is one piece of, uh, uh, one tool in your toolkit for really understanding and working with teens in a support group modality. Now, the guide itself, the Teen Support Group Guide, may be downloaded from our website, and our member programs received hard copies last summer. So if, if you are a member program of WICSAP, you may want to search your office and make sure that you know where the Teen Support Group Guide in hard copy is. So we've really focused on teens because we know that so many programs are working with teens, we know that teens have been a focus of prevention efforts, but not necessarily of intervention. So many programs are doing teen prevention outreach and, and teen prevention groups, but not as many are doing survivor groups for teens. And because there are certain particular challenges and considerations when you're working with teens in an advocacy setting. So we had some goals as we went through this. Um, the first was that we're not trying to tell people how they should run their groups. We're trying to offer considerations, ideas, activities, resources, and content that facilitators can take and can adapt to meet the needs of their own communities and their own groups. As we worked on this project, our guiding theme was resilience. Um, that's really a, a critical factor as we're working with teens. We wanted teens to finish the group with information and with confidence to move forward. We wanted them to be able to acknowledge what's happened in their lives and what, what those impacts have been and to normalize those impacts, but really also to talk about how do you heal, how do you move forward, and how do you build in protective factors so that you can minimize the risk of re-victimization. So, we are trying to incorporate the principles that are most important in advocacy to have a fresh look at what teens can accomplish and to help facilitators have the tools and resources they need to have successful survivor support groups. So I'm going to um, start off and talk about the first principle that we um, really want to incorporate into support group practice. Before I do that, I just want to address, um, we had a question, um, as Jennifer mentioned, that we were doing some revisions to our core Circle of Hope guide. Um, those are in process right now, and really it's just, um, you know, making sure that our resources are really current with promising practice. And so we try to review our work every several years and just see how we can further improve and kind of keep up with changes in the field. So I can't really give you really definitive things right now, but as soon as those changes are done and the um, revised version is uh, ready, it will be available on our website. So empowerment-based advocacy. Um, what we mean by this is really that we believe in survivors' ability to take care of themselves and to know best what they need, and that we're promoting a sense of power from within by supporting their self-determination and autonomy. And I think that we, you know, would all agree with this philosophy when it comes to our advocacy work, but sometimes our personal biases can be a barrier to really putting this principle into practice when we're working with young people. So it might be helpful to just ask yourself um, in your work now or as you're starting out a group, what messages am I sending to teens in my interactions with them? Uh, one of the facilitators we talked to shared, um, kids know whether you're interested in them or just interested in giving them information. And I think that that was kind of a helpful reframe of how, um, how our work with them can feel. And so we hope that in our interactions with teens, they feel like we really are truly interested and what's going on with them, um, what they need, and what they want. Empowerment-based advocacy is also connected to a strengths-based approach to our work. And 
some of the ideas that go along with that are just that we really believe that every individual has strengths and that we can collaborate with them to help them really recognize and utilize, utilize those strengths. It also means that we um, certainly acknowledge the harmful impact of trauma and abuse, but that we also um, see them as um, being a source of challenge and opportunity as survivors continue to heal. And it can be really empowering for young people um, if we can help them find those, those avenues in their healing process. Additionally, strength-based advocacy means that we really are taking people's goals and aspirations seriously, and I think this is especially important with, with young people. Sometimes they can seem lofty to us, um, but we need to foster them. And finally, just that we really approach advocacy as, um, as a collaboration with survivors, no matter what their age. So what does this um, really look like in the, in the context of group? Um, first and foremost, I think it means just providing lots of accurate, useful information. And, you know, the saying information is power, I think is especially true for young people who, um, you know, often don't get all of the information because we feel like we need to guard them from that or they're not ready for it. Um, but I think information is a much better alternative to fear and the unknown. So if there's information or content as you're planning your group that you are thinking about leaving out or glossing over, just really be conscious of the reasons why you may be doing that. Um, and if it's just because, you know, you think that they are too young or they're not mature enough to handle it, well, just really reflect on that and also remember that um, these young people have really survived a lot and um, are already dealing with very um, quote-unquote adult issues. So they deserve to have the information that they need to, to recover from those experiences. Our goal is to really give survivors the information they need to make the decisions that are best for them. And we need to um, believe that they are capable of doing that when they have the right information. So what this might look like um, in your screening or matching process, as we like to call it, just being really clear about what the group content is going to include, what the process is going to look like, so that they can make a decision about what, whether or not they're ready to participate. Information about confidentiality is also really important, so I would encourage you to talk about confidentiality early and often. Um, Specifically, I think mandated reporting obligations are really um, pertinent when we're working with young people. Just being really clear what information um, would trigger you to have to make a mandated report. And then if they do choose to share that information with you eventually, we can understand that as more of a choice on their part, um, knowing that you will be making a report rather than a surprise for them that that's going to be happening. And I will talk about confidentiality about 18 more times this morning, so uh, we'll revisit some of the nuances of that. Learn about other resources and help teens to gain access. Oftentimes, teens underutilize services because they don't know that they're there or that they have a right to them, and they also may not know exactly what that's going to look like. So we want to make sure that we're familiar with um, the resources in our community and that we're also really clear about what services um, those organizations can provide and what that would mean for a teen. So have those conversations with your community partners so that when you're directing teens to those resources, you're really making informed referrals. And then once again, they have the information um, to decide whether or not that's going to be a good fit for their needs. Examine your own beliefs and biases. Um, everyone has them. So it's very normal. I think the difference is whether or not you're aware of them and reflecting upon them. So it's just helpful to kind of ask yourself, why am I feeling, thinking, acting as I am? Where is that coming from? And what, may, what might I need to do differently if 
um, those actions or beliefs are coming from a place that may not be true or fair or um, healthy for young people. I think an important piece of this is just really remembering, too, that teens are experiencing a lot of judgment in their lives, um, partially because of perhaps when they disclose the abuse, but also just because that's kind of a dynamic of young people's lives, and we definitely don't want to bring um, our own judgment into the group setting and into our work with young people. Listen, it sounds easy, but um, as the earlier facilitator quote, I think, showed, oftentimes when we work with young people, we really get into a habit of telling instead of listening. I think one of the easy ways to do make sure that teens know we're listening to them in the group setting is just to really um, provide opportunities for their feedback and find ways to incorporate that so it's really clear to them we're hearing what you're saying, we've heard your needs, what you want to get out of group, and that we're flexible enough to make those adjustments so that this is really an experience that is going to work for you. Maintain a positive, hopeful tone. I think Jennifer talked a little bit about this in the beginning, but it kind of goes back to, you know, that strength-based advocacy approach in the concepts of positive youth development, just that we really are going to have high expectations for young people and in their capacity to learn and grow. And we want to validate what they've been through, but we really want to give them hope for the future. They have a lot of years ahead of them that they can really create um, the life that they want for themselves despite what has happened. Knowing that learning travels in all directions, just really approaching group um, from the belief that we are learning from young people as well and also that they have a lot to teach each other. And that's certainly feedback that we got from facilitators, just that they felt like when they really kept an open mind in their work with teens, that they got a lot out of the experience and that it shaped the way that they facilitated group and also generally how they interacted with teens moving forward. Trauma-informed services is another core principle that we want to integrate into our group practice. And basically, this just means that we really approach our work through, through a lens um, of understanding how trauma affects people and how it can um, shape their lives. And one of the important principles of trauma-informed care is that healing happens in relationships. So that is a huge component of um, the group process in general. We're really trying to establish relationships among group members and also based on the content and the discussions that we have during group, we want to help um, teen survivors build healthy relationships outside of group as well and be able to identify um, those relationships that are going to help them heal. So one of the important um, kind of background work that you might want to do before you start working with teens is just getting an idea of um, a general understanding of the neurobiology of trauma. So we certainly aren't asking you to, um, you know, delve into this area of work. We're all in the social services field for a reason, but it can be helpful to have an understanding of how trauma um, changes the brain and how it also may affect the way that survivors interpret and respond to certain situations. So, for example, something that may be really pertinent to the interactions that are happening in your group is that oftentimes survivors of trauma may perceive certain interactions, people, situations um, as being more hostile than someone who had not experienced trauma. And so they may be more sensitive to things that are going on in group, to those conversations that sometimes get heated. And so we want to just keep in mind that's just one of the ways in which a survivor of trauma may respond differently as a result of what they've experienced. We know that 
trauma also has significant health and educational impacts. And if you're not familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, I would highly recommend that you Google that um, because I think it really informs the way that we do our work and the importance of intervention and also of prevention because the um, the impact that it has on people in the long term is just really staggering. So if we can keep those things in mind, um, it may help us better assess people's needs as they're going through group, just that they may be dealing with um, other health issues, um, what they experience may impact their educational time in schools, and how can we be advocating with teachers or addressing those needs as well. Learn about teen development. Um, understanding typical youth development kind of helps us to understand their behaviors and how these behaviors may also be shaped by the trauma that they've experienced. So, for example, when we're talking about young people, um, risk-taking, exploration, experimentation, that's really a normal developmental process for teens. But as we know, those, some of those behaviors may be exacerbated um, because of the trauma, and it may shape some of the coping strategies that young people use. So one of the things that we talk about in the guide um, when we address coping is that we really want to validate those coping strategies um, that even though they may not be um, healthy, we really want to validate that they did serve a purpose. So substance abuse, um, sometimes cutting or self-harm, we certainly aren't you know, encouraging those things but we want to make sure survivors feel supported in that, you know, when they were experiencing trauma, those coping responses made sense to them. And also, let's talk about some other alternatives um, that we can use moving forward that will um, be healthier and safer for you. This is also one of the reasons that it's really important to include content in your groups about boundaries and relationships um, healthy sexuality, because these are also issues that teens are um, learning about and dealing with it in their development, but that their understanding may have been um, skewed by the abuse. And so we want to provide them um, accurate and comprehensive information on these topics to help them get back on a healthy developmental path. And I think something to keep in mind when we're talking about these issues, I think this especially comes up around um, healthy sexuality, is that as facilitators, it's not our role to um, provide them with our values. We're giving them information, and then we want them to take that information, explore their relationships and sexuality, um, and decide what they want. Not We're not giving them information to tell them to live their life in a certain way. So what we also know about trauma um, from the Adverse Childhood Experiences study is that people who have experienced one type of trauma have often um, experienced other types. So you may have um, several participants in your group who have a sexual abuse history, but um, may also have a physical abuse history or may have a substance abusing caregiver. And we really wanna be cognizant that young people are coming to the group setting with those things playing out in their lives as well. And so their needs may go beyond um, just dealing with the sexual assault in a vacuum. One of the facilitators we spoke with shared um, that teen groups were challenging for her because as opposed to groups with adult women, the young people she worked with were um, often still experiencing harm in their homes or in new relationships. And so we really want to be cognizant of that. And I think that's also going back to why confidentiality is so important because if teens are still experiencing harm, they may be sharing things throughout the group that would um, trigger a new report. And just in general, when we're talking about trauma, just 
when you're considering any materials that you want to use in the group, just be thinking about those things in terms of their potential for um, triggering trauma reactions and have a plan ideally with a co-facilitator about how you're going to um, help people through that. Prioritizing group safety, I think, is um, definitely connected to our understanding of trauma and how it may impact folks. Um, when we talk to facilitators about the concept of safety, they shared that the number one concern of their team participants was confidentiality. So we want to talk about that in terms of our work with them, and then we also want to be clear about that in terms of those group agreements and um, how information is not going to be shared outside of the group, especially if it's, you know, in a school setting um, where there's a lot of intermingling going on. As I mentioned, I think we would encourage two facilitators whenever possible just to increase um, your ability to respond to any safety concerns during um, the course of group as well as, um, you know, anyone's reactions to the content. This also comes into play certainly when we're talking about just logistics of your group. So uh, what, are the go what are going to be the transportation considerations? Are folks going to need to be taking buses home at, you know, 8 p.m. at night when it's dark outside? Does your setting feel private for people? Uh, when are you holding the group? Um, what does your room setup look like? Does it feel safe? Do people have enough personal space? Certainly, we hope that in your everyday work with folks and during your matching process that you are talking about any um, current safety concerns, that you're doing that safety planning at the individual level, and then you're addressing with the group anything that may affect folks in attendance. And I think just in general, you know, having a really thorough matching process so that you are helping to ensure that everyone is really ready for the group process and the content before you're putting people in the same room together to work through some really tough issues. Finally, when we're talking about building trust, I think that we all um, really believe that as we do this work that we are trustworthy people. And um, unfortunately, these teams don't yet have necessarily a reason to believe that we are trustworthy. And that may often be due to the other experiences that they've had with adults in their lives who they thought that they could trust and then were betrayed or hurt by them. So it's not personal. Um, just remember to be patient. Give them time to establish that rapport with you. And be really transparent with them and also consistent. I think developing really clear group agreements and modeling those and being consistent in their enforcement is also key to building trust among the groups, as well as the session progression. And I think that you'll see if you look through our curriculum that we really put a lot of thought into um, how soon we delved into some of the tough conversations. And so you want to kind of start off the beginning of the group with a little bit more lighter content than maybe happening, you know, in sessions five and six. And that just gives a chance for people to get comfortable, to feel that they can trust um, others in the group and feel that it's safe for them to be sharing their information or exploring their experiences um, as things kind of get more into the nitty gritty. And once again, um, confidentiality is a huge part of building trust. And I'll just say in general, I think not just with teens, but with anyone, we all kind of want to know where our information is going before we are going to share it. So keep that in mind as you are talking about confidentiality with the young people in your group and setting those agreements. Each of the principles that we built this group curriculum on works with the other principles, and they're all important, and they all lift up teen survivors. 
So the anti-oppression framework that we work from as advocates is an integral part of any work that we would do with teen survivors. And it plays into trust building, it plays into trauma-informed care, it plays into certainly the empowerment model. And what it does though is it takes the lens through which we look at what's happening to teens and expands it so that we're not just looking at the teens themselves and the people who have harmed them, but we're also looking at this in the context of power disparities and where those power disparities came from and how they intersect with each other and how this works on both the individual and the institutional level. So for example, we have a little safe zone logo on the slide here because, for example, we would like people to think about what would it be like for uh, a young person who is LGBTQ, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, um, uh, gay, or, or queer or questioning, to come to a mainstream organization, for example, and to seek services as a teenager. Teens often don't feel that they have the power in their personal life to accomplish things that are important to them, and we want to give clear messages about uh, their abilities and about the barriers and challenges that society may place in their way for a variety of reasons. And it starts really at the very beginning. Logan mentioned the matching process that we talk about when we're when we're looking at young people and trying to figure out whether the group is going to be the most helpful place for them. And we call it a matching process rather than a traditional screening process because a screening process implies that the facilitator has all the power and is saying yes or no. Uh, it's almost like an audition for the group, whereas a matching process shows that we're really working with teen clients to help explore what their needs are, to discuss the range of services that are available, and then to consider whether group may be the best choice. And that consideration needs to happen both from the team and from the facilitator. And that's an example of how an anti-oppression approach and an empowerment approach work together in a very practical way. So we, we look very hard at how to make these teen groups inclusive and accessible. First of all, we know that in many communities, especially in rural communities, your group is going to need to address a variety of needs because you're probably not going to have enough numbers of people to have a very specific targeted teen group. Therefore, your group must be a welcoming and appropriate setting for a whole variety of teens to come and have their needs met. So you may have a, a group in which you have both survivors of child sexual abuse as well as peer sexual violence, and we know that there is a lot of overlap in those two forms of victimization. So you may have people who have experienced both of those kinds of victimization. You may have a teen who's pregnant. You may have a teen who has a baby. Um, you may have teens with intellectual or physical disabilities, and you may have teens at varying chronological levels and varying, varying levels of maturity. We all know that you could have two 14-year-olds who might even have the same date of birth, but they're going to be very, very different in their development. And um, in some cases, programs are able to have, for example, a younger teen group and an older teen group. In other cases, they may be integrating teens who are at differing chronological ages and levels of maturity, and the group has to be inclusive and accessible for, for different kinds of teens. It's really, really critical to consider what can we do as an agency, as an organization, to increase accessibility to these groups. So, for example, if you have... Um, potential participants who have young children, you might want to consider the possibility of offering childcare. And a lot of times we may think about that for adult survivor groups and forget that there are a number of teens who are also parents. 
certainly choosing a, a physical barrier-free meeting space, if at all possible, is one of the ways in which you show your commitment to including people with physical disabilities. And, you know, we really can't consider these as add-ons to our work because what we've typically considered to be special populations, such as um, teenagers with intellectual disabilities, uh, these young people are actually largely the targets of sexual victimization. You know, the, the disproportionate number of teens who have, who have been sexually victimized are teens who may fall into some of these categories that would be um, where we may need to make some additional efforts toward inclusiveness. So if your outreach in the community is actually successful and you're actually inviting in a representative sample of teens in the community who have been victimized, you're going to have teens with a variety of backgrounds and a variety of different issues in your group. One of the most useful ways to approach this is to recognize that, that we don't know just from meeting with somebody or talking with them briefly what barriers or challenges might interfere with their ability to participate fully in group. So you might want to ask these questions. You can say to, to every young person when you're trying to do that matching process and to see whether a group might be appropriate, what can I do to make sure that you get the most out of group? And perhaps give some some suggestions and some examples of things that you've, some accommodations that you've made or some ways in which you've uh, worked with other teens to make the group more accessible or more inclusive. And then if you have a young person who is willing to talk about what their needs are, you might ask, are there any particular needs that you want to share with the group? And are there any particular needs that you really are sharing with me, but that you would prefer not to share with the rest of the group. Um, so, for example, you may have a teen who, um, let's say, has Asperger's syndrome and uh, has some difficulty understanding emotional presentations sometimes. They may not get it when someone is talking about emotions. If that person would like to have some additional explanation in the group, if someone is talking about an emotional experience, you might be able to work with the potential participant and say, well, how, how could you explain that to the group? What would be a way that would be comfortable for you to talk about that so that you can maintain your own dignity and privacy, but you can also ask for what you need so that you can participate as fully as possible in the group. So it's a process. Making the group inclusive and accessible means that you think about the images that you present when, if you're um, creating flyers or brochures. It means that you are approaching people who may work with special populations in your community and partnering with them to make it more inclusive and accessible. It means that you may, that you're always asking young people as they come through your doors, what is going to make it possible for you to participate, and how do you want to handle that? And this is a this is an empowerment strategy as well. It's a way to give dignity and to work with the team so that they have that experience of uh, somebody saying, I really want to make this work for you, and I know that you're the expert in your own life, which is also a trauma-informed approach. So... All of these principles come together as we try to make groups inclusive and accessible. Another aspect of anti-oppression is to, is to have group ground rules that come from the group but also um, create a safe community. And again, this, this also inter intersects with the trauma-informed safe space that you're trying to create. But rather than saying, well, in this group, we do this and we do that, and this is, this is how it's going to be, you approach it as a facilitator by helping participants understand why ground rules are important and how they help to promote safety, how they help to promote healing, and how they help to promote an atmosphere of mutual respect. Um, 
you really want to encourage the participants in the group to be have an active voice in crafting these guidelines and in establishing consequences for violations. And, and young people can be really amazingly creative and forthcoming if they're invited into this process. Once those ground rules and consequences have been established, then as the adult in the room, having an anti-oppression approach means that you use respectful and non-shaming language when you're enforcing those consequences. So, for example, in, in most groups, uh, one of the ground rules would be that you can't come to group while you're after you've been drinking or if you're high. And if someone were to come into the group, you might say something like, I see you've had something to drink before coming to group this evening. As you know, one of our ground rules is being clean and sober when you attend group. Let's talk about how you can get home safely tonight, and then we'll see you for next week's group when you've not been drinking. So you're keeping your covenant with the rest of the group to keep the group safe and to enforce the ground rule, but you're not shaming the person. You're making it clear that the behavior is what you're focusing on, not them personally. It's not an attack. Uh, you're being respectful of their safety, and you're offering them a way to come back to the group and kind of save face. So um, that would be a really practical example of how you would put this principle into action. It's also really useful to make sure that the ground rules and the group norms allow a place where, where teens can explore their own identities and culture, okay? Um, you don't want the group to become a microcosm of an oppressive society. So within the group, people need to feel free to talk about gender identity if that's something that they choose to share. They need to um, have a sense of comfort in talking about their cultural experiences and to know that those cultural experiences will be respected and and listened to by the rest of the group members. Um, if they share a need for an accommodation or something that the other group members can do that's going to help them to participate more fully in the group, that needs to be heard with a respectful ear. And so making those expectations really clear and creating, to the extent it's humanly possible, um, a non-oppressive environment within the group itself can be amazingly powerful. This may be the first place for some of these teens where they feel they can truly be themselves, they can be heard, they don't have an adult who is dictating what they should and shouldn't be doing. And... Um, where they, they begin to reclaim a sense of, of personal power or maybe find it for the first time. And then another vital part of this is to really include a, an age-appropriate discussion of social influences and root causes of sexual violence in your group learning and discussion, and we do have that built into the group curriculum. So you're going to use teen-friendly language, teen-friendly activities, um, because we know that sexual violence is rooted in our culture. It's not just something that happens from one person to the other. In the group, you're going to use relevant and up-to-date examples of social media and music to illustrate the points and have the group be participating and contributing to that, those examples, because they're, you know, unless you're pretty uh, close to your own teenage years, you're in a whole other generation, even, even a, a group facilitator who's quite a young person is in a different cultural generation than teens because of the rapidity with which our society changes now. Um, you want to help teens to recognize the connection between behavior anywhere on the continuum of sexual violence and sexual assault itself. And so understanding that speaking disrespectfully and disparagingly about people's bodies or harassing somebody or making ugly jokes with sexual content is part of that continuum that creates a culture and an environment in which sexual assault and sexual violence can thrive. As teens move through the group process, they're going to become more knowledgeable and more sophisticated about these concepts. And 
one very powerful intervention is to ask teens how they might transform their own personal anger and frustration into activism for social justice. And to give them some examples of young people who are doing just that, for example, there's a program out of Seattle called Real Girls, Girls is G-R-R-L-S, uh, which is a media arts and leadership program for girls in which they create media content instead of simply being consumers of media content, and they try to change the conversation about what's happening to young people. So those things can be really fun in group, and they can also be um, a transformative experience as young folks understand that what happened to them is part of a larger picture. As we look at incorporating the principle of survivor-led services into the group, I'd like to just share a little more about how we put together the guide. So within, within the support group guide, there is a, an actual suggested eight-session curriculum, but it's not a prescriptive curriculum. Do this on this night, do that on another night. We have activities, we have uh, suggested topics for learning and discussion, we have resources, and we have considerations for facilitators for each of the topics for the eight sessions so that you can customize, you can take those tools and those materials and customize the group to meet the needs of your community and your participants. And in addition, we want to know what the, the participants in the group really need and want and how we can provide support and resources based on their needs. Because even in the same community, two groups, two sets of groups that are led at two different times are probably going to be different. They're going to look different because the participants are different and their needs are different. So we want to ensure that there's a place for survivors' voices to be heard. And sometimes that means customizing the actual group process. Sometimes you may be able to have more than the eight sessions and have a particular session that's available for teens to, to craft themselves. Um, it's really important as you do that, though, that you maintain one of the principles that Logan talked about, which was the timing and flow of the group being key to group development and the building of trust. So you don't want to get into topics that are extremely challenging and uh, require a level of trust before the group is really there. So this is where it's, it's that uh, balance between incorporating and listening to the voices of survivors and making sure that, that they have a say in how the group is led and also using your own expertise to help provide a, a sense of timing and flow that's going to create safety and trust in the group. So as the facilitator, you are the facilitator, you're not the leader of the group. So we want to show teens that they have power in their lives instead of just telling them that. And there are some ways that we can do that as facilitators. For example, you can ask for input and feedback at every stage. So in the very beginning, when you're doing that matching slash screening process with teens, ask them what would you like to see? What's important to you in this group? Uh, what would make you feel like you've had a really successful group experience? And as you go through the group, ask the group, is this working? You know, would you prefer that we spend more time on this or that? Have options and choices as you go through each group session. And of course, you want to have a robust evaluation process so that at the end of the group, you get really detailed feedback about what worked and what didn't work. Um, in addition to using that feedback to shape the group, it's also valuable to be transparent about, about the fact that you're doing that. So you're not only doing it, but you're, you're telling the group and showing the group that you are using what they say to modify and transform the group. So one example would be to say, um, you know, during the last the team group that we did last year or whenever, participants said that it would be helpful to move this topic into the second or third session instead of waiting until later to address it, and that's why we've chosen to talk about it tonight. 
So you're telling your current group that you have changed your curriculum based on feedback from a previous group, and that helps them to understand that their feedback is also going to be important. So this is the team's group, not the facilitator's group, and teams often have really great ideas. Um, one of the facilitators we talked to said that the group that she was working with decided to come up with a group name, and that really led to a sense of pride and camaraderie amongst uh, the participants, that they really enjoyed having a name, they, they felt proud of their participation in the group, they weren't kind of slinking around thinking, well, I'm in this sexual assault survivors group, it, they had, I, I, I can't remember what the actual name of the group was, um, but it was something that made them feel proud, like being a team member. Um, we have to remember that teens, like all survivors, are the experts on their own lives. We really don't know what's happened in their lives and, and how they've perceived it unless they tell us. So... As a facilitator, you have the sometimes daunting task of trying to balance the group structure, which is in place for consistency, for safety, for providing valuable information and resources with flexibility. And that flexibility helps you to meet the, the needs that the group expresses. It helps you to respond to issues in a timely way. And it helps you to learn from participants because they are going to be your greatest teachers. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, in practical terms, you're going to have an outline for each week, but you're going to also know that you might extend a certain activity um, or a discussion if it seems like the group is really fully engaged in it, that they really want to uh, explore that more, and you might shorten it if people are just kind of um, gazing at the ceiling. <laughs> Um, if you can, it's sometimes good to create a specific space, for example, the next to last session, for participants to bring their own questions and concerns and to highlight that, that that's really the main topic of the night is, you know, what is it that you came into this group wanting to discuss or wanting to know about that we haven't gotten to yet because we don't want you to leave the group without having those needs addressed. Um, another thing you might do is you, you may choose the session topics for certain sessions within the group, but you might also have a menu of options for at least some of the sessions. So let's say you have an eight-session group, um, and maybe you have fixed topics for six of those sessions, but for a couple of sessions, you say, well, here are five or six topics that we could address. What would you like to do? And if you're going to do that, it's helpful to wait until the group has had a chance to form and develop some trust and be able to communicate with each other um, before you have that conversation because in session one, they may not know what topics are going to be most important to them, but by session four, they may be really clear that, that these are the things that are going to be important to them and that they would prefer to focus on those during those uh, flexible sessions. The other thing is that as advocacy organizations and programs, we strive to create culturally relevant, culturally sensitive services. So to do that within a teen survivor group, we have to have participant input. Um, we want to show that we value the cultural um, learnings and teachings and healing practices that participants bring to the group. So you might ask a question like, are there any specific things you've learned from your family or your culture that have helped you to cope? And we take a strengths-based approach in general, and people's strengths often come from their cultural heritage. So that's, that's a way to show that you value the strength and the unique um, experiences that, that participants bring to the group and that they have something to share with each other and can learn from each other about that. So it's just this anti-oppression approach helps us to to, to think about, you know, all of the kinds of oppression that young people may experience and 
what can we do just within our own little world, within our own little group, to try to rebalance some of those power disparities? Um, we know from a, a publication that's called 40 Developmental Assets from the Search Institute um, that there are strengths that, that kids need to develop as they grow up in order to have healthy development um, during the teen years, and that some of those strengths are personal power and responsibility. And we also know that we want to build resilience. We want to help young folks feel resilient, feel a sense of hope, feel a sense of pride in themselves, and uh, that as we address these power disparities and as we point out the way in which expectations kind of push their heads underwater, sometimes we give an opportunity for um, a different lens on the world and for specific ways in which group participants can begin to spread their wings and to to feel that that they can see where some of those harmful experiences in their life have come from and how to address them. So Jennifer just provided some really good examples of why um, survivor-led services are really important to teens. Are there any other reasons that you think this is especially valuable in teen groups? Um, if you have other ideas, you're welcome to put those into the chat. While people are doing that, <laughs> let's see if we have. Okay, we have some. Um, Liliana says it helps to normalize their feelings and experiences. And that's so critical because teen survivors often feel like they're the only ones in the world who have experienced what they've experienced. And, uh, and sometimes they feel that there's something really wrong with them for their reactions to sexual abuse or assault. Someone also shared that survivor-led services are really important in um, fostering community leadership for young people. Um, that for teens to feel like they've really been truly heard and valued, we need to respond to what they are telling us, incorporate their needs, request input and autonomy into the facilitation of the group. Uh, somebody commented asking whether we were talking about um, teens as both male and or female survivors, and absolutely. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, groups would be addressing one or the other of those of those groups, but um, there certainly are male teen survivor groups, and those are absolutely valuable. We try to use gender neutral language as much as we could within the teen guide, um, so that we're not talking just about girls here. I, I want to make that really clear. We know that a substantial number of boys also experience sexual assault and sexual abuse, especially as children. And so there's often a need for male survivor groups as well. And that we really um, encourage facilitators to um, screen or match participants based on their um, self-described identity. So if someone identifies as female, then they should be welcomed into your um, female teen group. Absolutely. Someone also mentioned that um, giving teens a voice helps um, helps them to feel more confident. And I think that kind of goes back to um, the 40 developmental assets that Jennifer mentioned, just that we really want to provide opportunities to um, for teens to feel like they are capable of doing things, that they are accomplished, that they have um, skills, and that they have addressed challenge successfully. So that's a really great point as well. Um, there's a, 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 an important comment here which says that uh, it's important to make clear what the role, what the facilitator's role is to further empower the participants. and. That is really true. That's one of the reasons why we encourage the facilitator to be very transparent about 
mandated reporting, about confidentiality issues, about when when something is really the group's decision and when it may be, for example, agency policy. To, you know, for example, the group may say, well, we really think it would be great to have child care on site here. And the, the facilitator may even think that's a great idea, but perhaps there's an agency policy that says that that's not possible due to liability concerns. So the facilitator um, is expressing what the boundaries are, and that boundaries are always important, and not not pretending to offer choices where there is no choice actually available. That's not something that builds trust. Uh, I think teens in general want to know what adults' roles are, what their role is, and so in circumstances where the teens have uh, have choice. That should be clear in a circumstance where it's really the facilitator's responsibility to make a decision, then the facilitator needs to be really clear about that to enhance trust. Someone also shared that it is just really important to validate dual language spaces, to have that as an option depending on the needs of your community, um, and to also allow people to have the space to share second-generation immigrant experiences. So uh, we also have a comment that creating a, uh, a survivor-led services is a way for teens to feel like it's their own group instead of someone else's. They have a sense of belonging, and as has already been said, it creates uh, a sense of community and leadership. And that's right. That that this and that's why the naming thing was kind of cool because the teens kind of took ownership of the group and said, "This is our group, and this is what we want to call ourselves." Um, and 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 that help and support that they provide to each other within the group is just so powerful. Those of you who've done teen groups, I think, really um, know and understand that it can be it can be difficult sometimes you know teams can be tough on each other at times but they can also be amazingly supportive and having a group in which they feel like they have a voice can create an atmosphere where they feel free to offer help to each other before we move on we did have a question <clears throat> i think based on some of our discussion here as to whether we are recommending that um it's best to separate genders for group. And I think, you know, we really are careful not to be um, super definitive. We really want folks to do, to really trust their experience and expertise as facilitators and make that decision in their community. But um, this is one of the issues that we, you know, have looked into, that we've talked with facilitators about. And what the feedback we've received on that is that really having mixed gender groups um, it's probably best as a second step. So it may not be um, the best idea for participants to be in a mixed gender group for their first group experience. And this is because, you know, addressing some of those um, social norms and how that plays into sexual violence, the gendered issues there, um, it just adds an additional layer of complexity that certainly we, you know, want to address when it feels safe and people are ready for that and also when facilitators feel like they have the expertise to manage that um, in a mixed gender group. Uh, we have a, a comment about, uh, as parents, are we communicating with our kids about how to help a friend in need if one of his or her friends is going through a sexually abusive situation because teens usually turn to their friends before they turn to their parents, and that's absolutely true. Um, you might like to look on the WICSAP website. We have resources specifically for parents, and Kat will post that link for you. Uh, that is, we have a, a suggested curriculum guide for parents to help keep teens safer in relationships, and there's some information there that, whether that's within a, a group setting with parents or just as you're working in individual advocacy or prevention work, um, some of these resources may be useful. Okay. So thanks for that feedback. We're going to keep plugging along, but we should have some additional time at the end for further discussion. So in in the support 
group guide, we have information about logistics, about facilitators, about how to sustain groups, and we have some information that uh, people really want to know, which is how do you get people for teen groups and how do you keep them in these teen groups? So um, how do you recruit folks and how do you retain them within groups so that you have a group that actually goes the distance? Um, and we've come up with some really specific suggestions in the support group manual on if you check out pages seven to nine. And I want to remind you that, that the support group manual is available for free download from the WixApp website. So that if you don't have a hard copy of that, you can download it from our website. But we have lots of suggestions there on how you might recruit participants, how you could market your group. One of our favorite practical suggestions is to create inexpensive business cards. And, you know, you can get business cards for 10 bucks for hundreds of them, <laughs> depending on where you do it. But put an attractive image on it and a brief description of the group and contact information. So this is different from your, your agency's business card. It's a card for the group itself, and it just has something that draws the eye a few words that explains what the group is and then how you get in touch to follow up. And then those cards can be with you wherever you go out in the community. There's something that you might hand out to system partners in, in meetings. You could bring them to the school. You could um, have them with you and give them to any other professional that you're talking with. And also they're kind of a reminder even for people within your own agency to think about teen survivor support group when they're working with a teen client. Um, if you're naming your group and you want to have flyers and or cards or whatever, think about what you call the group and how that will appear to teens. You want you don't want to be so um, what's the word broad about it that people have no idea what the group is about, but you also want to make sure that the that the name of the group is engaging and not stigmatizing. So if you happen to have a teen advisory council for your agency, which, by the way, is a really cool thing to have, you might ask them for suggestions. You could run some names by them or ask them for some ideas. Um, if you don't, then you might approach another teen advisory council within your community. For example, Planned Parenthood often have teen advisory councils and run those ideas by them because you want you want teens to be interested in the group and not to put them off, certainly. Um, and you want to also ask them, how can we reach out to teens directly within the community? Because we don't want all the referrals to come through service providers because we know that the vast majority of teen survivors are probably not connected with another service provider. So, Take a look at the at the manual if you're looking at how to get teens for your group. Um, in terms of how to keep them in your group, there are a lot of things that you can do that will help. One is to really do a thorough job of working through possible barriers to attendance when you're talking to pretend, potential participants. So when you're doing that matching process, to say to potential participants, what are the things that you can think of that might make it challenging or difficult for you to attend group on a regular basis to make that commitment. And if they say, well, you know, I'm not sure about transportation or child care or um, the time of day or any of those things to really brainstorm and think that through and to think about what resources might help to mitigate those barriers for potential participants. Another idea in terms of retaining group members is to make sure that you're really customizing group content so it's relevant to the people who are in the group because you want people who will stay in a group in which they feel engaged by and large unless there are external barriers that make it almost impossible for them. So if they feel like it is their group and their voices are being heard and the what's being talked about in group is really relevant to their experiences, they're much more likely to stick around through the eight sessions or ten sessions or whatever you choose to, to do. Um, within the group, you could have a group brainstorm about potential 
possible attendance obstacles and workarounds. So you could say, um, you know, it's really important that we all attend each session so we can build trust and learn together. What can each of you do and what can we do as a group to make that more likely? And the group members will come up with things that you've never thought of probably, and that's going to help the group so that Somebody might say something like, well, sometimes I just kind of feel really down and I don't feel like coming to group or, you know, I feel kind of worried about things. And as a group, the group can brainstorm, well, what could you do in that situation? And they may come up with some some really um, creative and useful ways to help that group member get to group and, and overcome those issues. Um, it's also important to... Think through whether the time and the location and the other arrangements really work for teens. Logan talked about safety considerations, um, convenience, certainly the time in terms of, of school commitments and transportation. All of those things are critical. You want to make sure that you get ongoing feedback, that you get feedback during the matching process, and that you also get feedback from evaluation at the end of the group. So sometimes a group is just not going to gel, and it quite frankly falls apart. And that's going to happen. If you do enough of these groups, you're probably going to have a group in which that happens. And so some of the things that we really uh, would like to say are don't be too hard on yourself. No matter how, how talented and skillful a group facilitator you are, you may not be able to win them all. There may be external factors that get in the way. Um, and sometimes groups just, the, the mix of people for all that you've tried to match them up well just doesn't work very well. But if something like that happens, then you want to find out from participants, from your system partners, and from the community, uh, what are some of the things that you could do to make improvements, to change things. Don't give up at that point, I guess, is what we're just saying, is, is stick with it use it as a learning experience and try to figure out what can you do differently the next time so that the group is going to be more successful. Sometimes you may have to think about getting some extra resources to enhance the setting, to provide food if you have to meet, for example, after school, um, to consider whether you might want to offer child care, um, and to figure out about transportation. Some of those things take money, and so it might be worth identifying those needs and then seeing how your agency might be able to help you meet those needs. And then really to go back and, and reconsider whether teens are getting what they need in the group. Uh, refocus on those survivor-led aspects that we talked about and really hone in on those. And then remember that your group is only one piece of the puzzle in supporting teen survivors. So what additional support do teens have in your community? Are there a range of community services to support these teens and do they know of the ones that might be helpful to them? So those are those are all things that can help you to kind of bounce back and ha either turn a group around if it seems as though it's not going well or at least use lessons learned so that you can have a more successful group the next time around. So we wanted to just hone, hone in on a couple of things that came up a lot in our development of the guide and in our conversation with facilitators. And I told you I was going to come back to confidentiality, so um, here comes the spiel. Really, confidentiality um, and making sure that is clear is not a small task, but it's a necessary foundation for all sexual assault services. Um, and that includes your support group setting as well. So we really want to emphasize that providing a teen support group should be an extension of the services that you are already offering to young people at your agency. So you are probably not ready to provide a group if you don't already have agency policies on serving minor survivors. Um, and if you don't have other existing services at your agency, to supplement the support group and meet young people's additional needs. And I, you know, as Jennifer mentioned, I think that goes back to retention that other things are going to come up for people in the group and we need to be able to provide one-on-one -on -one advocacy or therapy for them 
um, perhaps at the same time that they're in the group to really help them through the things that are coming up for them. So what I would say is, um, you know, ask yourself some of these questions around confidentiality, and I think that will probably help you determine maybe what still needs to be um, formalized at your agency prior to starting a group. So, for example, at what age can someone consent to services independently at your agency? In connection to this, who then has access to a youth record? Um, would a parent, would you tell a parent um, that their child was participating in your group? How would you respond if a parent called you and asked about the group? Um, who was in it? What was being talked about? What what their um, teen was sharing with you in the group setting? Do you have a really victim-centered agency practice around mandated reporting? Someone um, asked a question you know, what do you do if a teen survivor um, discusses or discloses ongoing victimization to you in the context of group? And, I mean, I think that's a great question because, like we talked about, it's probably pretty likely that many young people are still experiencing abuse in some form or another. So I'm speaking from the Washington perspective here. I know there are a lot of out-of-staters on this call, which is great, but I don't know all of your um, state laws. So if you're a practicing advocate in Washington, you are a mandated reporter, and if someone discloses something to you that has not already been reported, then you do need to make that report. So my guess is that anyone who's in your group has already made a disclosure that has been reported and addressed by the authorities, whether that's CPS, law enforcement, or both. Um, but if something comes out in the context of group that is new or in addition to that um, initial disclosure, you do need to report that. And like I said earlier, that report should never, ever be a surprise because those teens should know from day one that you're a mandated reporter, that you have to have um, a certain information about them and the abuse in order to make a report, and ideally, um, they should be involved in that reporting process if it gets to that place um, and if it's, that's their wish to make the report with you. And they should definitely know, um, you know, what may happen as a result of that report and you should be talking with them about any implications. So how could that impact their safety? Um, what's that going to do to their home life? So having those conversations um, thoroughly and in a really teen appropriate way so that we're, you know, we're giving examples that mirror what may be happening in teens' lives. Also, I'll briefly just say that um, confidentiality in Washington looks different in the support group setting than it does in your one-on-one -on -one advocacy. And so we know that when there's a third-party presence, um, that that waives privilege. And so certainly that group setting um, is not going to have privilege. So while you can definitely talk to people about the fact that everything that's shared in group is confidential, that additional protection of privilege um, is not going to be present just because of the nature of the group setting and that the information being shared is being heard by multiple people and not just between you and that one participant. And so that may impact um, what a survivor chooses to share in the group setting versus what they might want to talk to you about one-on-one. -on -one. The other um, tip that we wanted to address is just working in schools, and we know that a lot of facilitators do um, organize and coordinate their groups through the schools. And that has worked really well for people. There are definitely pros to that in terms of some of those recruitment and retention challenges that Jennifer talked about. But they also, um, doing, doing this work in schools also has some challenges. And so that's going to look different for every community. Just take some time to really evaluate what are the pros of this setting and what are some of the cons. So, for example, doing a group in a school may um, eliminate some of those transportation issues. Um, likely someone who's at school already has child care worked out, so that might not be a challenge to attendance. But it also may mean that your sessions can only be 45 minutes long due to the class schedule. There may be some privacy issues 
and you may experience some expectations from school administrators and staff uh, that may impact whether or not you're really able to do your work the way that you want and need to do it. So I think a good example of this was one of our facilitators uh, was talking with her school, with her local school about setting a, up a group there, and they said, yeah, that's fine. If someone discloses abuse in the context of the group, our school policy is that that information needs to go up the chain and the administrator needs to make that mandated report. And so the facilitator had to say, um, I hear you, and also, A, my services are confidential, so I can't share that information with you if someone discloses abuse in group, and B, me telling you and you making a report does not fulfill my mandated reporting obligation. And so those are just an example of some of the things that you're going to have to work out with your school partners and that you really want to have formalized in some sort of agreement. So there's just no question about people's roles um, and the information sharing in that setting. So I know our time is getting short and we still have a couple of questions we haven't addressed, so I'm going to just briefly talk about uh, this slide, which is really kind of summing up a lot of what we've talked about. One of the things I do want to let you know is that our curriculum is activity rich, that we have activities in every single session. Um, and of course, you don't have to use any particular activity if you don't like it or it doesn't seem to make sense to you. But we know that teens learn better if they're active learners. And it also reinforces the principles of, uh, of, of participation and activity and people sharing things with each other. And it makes the, the group more engaging, more interesting, um, and it's not you just lecturing by any, by any means. And we have considerations for each session, too, so that you have a chance to think through what are some of the issues that may come up? How can I prepare myself? What are some resources that I need to know? So we've tried to give some step-by-step -step information that you can use if you choose to. Some of the things that we truly believe, we believe that humor is an amazing tool for resilience. Introduce humor when it's appropriate and make sure the group is fun. That's where the activities come in too. You know, this is, you're talking about some dark subjects here, but you're also working with young people and um, we know that, that being able to laugh, being able to, to share, being able to uh, really use that humor and to, to have some fun with things is a very healing experience. Um, we suggest that you really work on building coping skills with participants before more difficult topics are introduced. And we have self-care activities, we have coping skill building activities, and as those skills are built, then teens are able to work with and to handle some of the more challenging topics. Here are some messages that, that are really useful for, team, for group participants. One is to just clearly say whatever you did to cope with what happened to you was the best you could do at the time, and here you are today. You did great. You really did. Um, we want teens to know that survivors can and do go on to lead amazing, productive, fabulous lives. We want them to know that Many kids think that they are to blame or that they're going crazy or that the dark days will never end, but these are normal reactions to an impossible situation, and it will get better. Um, and we want to, them to know that there are going to be ups and downs as they go through the healing process, but ultimately they're going to be able to be stronger and happier. So using the principles that we've talked about and that we've developed is a way in which you show these things as well as tell these things. So I think we have time for just a few more questions. And if we don't get to your question, um, this is our contact information. We're definitely happy to um, talk with you offline. So someone asked a little bit earlier if we had um, some good guiding questions to help teams open up in the group. And I think I. I would say to that that at the beginning and end of each session, we have um, oh, check-in and check-out questions. Yes, 
And those are really pretty light questions that we use to just kind of get people, get their brains in that space, um, get them kind of participating for the day, and then at the end of the group to really kind of bring them back to a safe um, place to kind of wrap up what we've talked about so that they're ready to go back out into the world um, after that, you know, hour and a half or two hours together. So I would encourage you to kind of look through the um, our curriculum and those sessions and see if any of those check-in or check-out questions uh, would help you in that way. So we have a couple of questions that make me know that we need to reinforce the idea that what we are talking about here is an advocacy group. This is not a therapy group. It's a psychoeducational support group. And so, for example, one of the questions is how detailed should documentation be? And as a general principle in our advocacy agencies for advocacy services, we recommend lean and mean uh, note-taking that basically all you have to do is to note what services are provided um, and that, that advocacy files are generally very, um, they're, they're focused on what services have been provided to survivors rather than on information that survivors have disclosed for the protection of the survivor. Um, so that, that's important. And then there was a question about whether group is a good idea before folks are working individually, and that, that's going to depend very much on the individual teen situation. Um, if a teen needs individual advocacy for whatever reason, then that's something that can, can happen at any point before, during, or after the group. Um, if they need to be in therapy in addition to being in a psychoeducational support group, that can also happen before, during, or after the group. So they're separate services, and as an advocate, you're going to assess that teen's needs and see what makes sense for them and in what sequence it makes sense. So we had a question as well about, um, depending on the age of the group, is it appropriate to share a story if the adult, I'm assuming the facilitator, is also a survivor? Um, once again, I don't think that we are definitively saying you should or should not um, disclose your personal trauma history to a group of any kind, whether it's teens or adults. What we would say is to be really conscientious about why you're doing it and to be thinking about how that is benefiting the group participants and the group experience before making that decision. Yes, and, and you know, that's a whole other conversation. I'm sorry that, that uh, our time is coming to an end here because uh, that could be a, a very productive conversation. But any of these considerations, you know, it's important to think those through to have a colleague and a supervisor that you can talk things through with and bounce them off of. One of the things that we go into in great detail in the guide is the co-facilitation relationship. If you have a co-facilitator and how important it is for you as a facilitator to have the support that you need to make all the complicated decisions you're going to have to make as you go through the course of the group and to deal with the fact that these groups are wonderful and thrilling and exciting and useful and empowering, and they're also difficult to do. You know, it's, it's hard work, but we believe very strongly that it is vital work, that it can be incredibly useful, that you're actually doing work that's going to help people prevent re-victimization, and that you're building skills and self-confidence that are going to help these teens throughout their lifetimes. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk um, about teen support groups just because we think that they're so important and we really want to um, help programs and advocates build their capacity to provide them for survivors. So like I said, please feel free to follow up with us if you have any additional questions. Please access the resources on our website. Use them um, how they best fit your needs. And we hope you will join us at our next training. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Please stand by.